We're back. I see mostly familiar faces, a couple new ones. Um, hello, I know there's a couple people out in uh, YouTube land watching tonight for a fact, so hello to all of you too. Uh, boy, I feel special. I get to say hello to people watching online. That's, that's new. <laughs> if you were with us last month, we talked about the sinking of the Carl Dean Bradley, so we focused on one shipwreck. This one's going to be a little different. I'm going to talk about the storm of 1905 on Lake Superior. So there's going to be multiple shipwrecks tonight. Hopefully I can keep them all straight because this was really a wild storm. Um, historians over the years argue which one was the worst one ever in Great Lakes history, and this one is considered one of the top three. Um, lots of shipwrecks to tell you about tonight. This one will be one of them, and I consider it to be the most dramatic story um, in Great Lakes history. It's just amazing. And everything I tell you about it, I don't have to dramatize it. It all really happened the way I will tell you. So, uh, like I said, we're talking about the actual storm, or an entire storm system. So to start out, I need to break out my best weatherman impersonation. So, on November 27th, 1905, we're going to have this low pressure system moving across Lake Superior. And it's going to center right around the Keweenaw Peninsula. Now, we have a low pressure system come in. You need to understand that the winds are going to cycle counterclockwise. What that's going to do in this particular storm is it's going to bring northeast winds. And if you look at this uh, satellite image, you're going to have your, uh, your winds coming down this way, which is, you can see all the stretch of water. That's called the fetch. The longer distance waves have to travel and the longer time that the winds are going to blow, those waves are going to build higher and higher. And if you notice, as you get down toward the western end of Lake Superior, it narrows down. It's, as it gets closer and closer to the loop, those shorelines get closer and closer. So really here from the Apostle Islands west, this whole zone is going to see about 18 ships wrecked in about a 24 hour period. Uh, you're going to have the big waves coming down to the northeast. You're going to have those waves ricocheting off the north shore, off the southern shore. And that is not the place to be if you were on a boat. And unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of them there. They knew it was coming. This was not a surprise storm. Even in 1905, there was a weather service. And they did have the storm signals out. They knew that this, uh, the system was moving in from the Dakotas. In 1905, storm signals consist of flags that are hoisted on a flagpole from weather stations at various ports and harbors. The world has not changed since 1905. Even back then, people really ignored the weatherman. And ship captains were definitely no different, especially maybe a little bit more so in 1905, because this is the era when we really start seeing the large steel freighters being built. You're starting to see four and 500 foot steel vessels. And for people that are used to working on wooden ships, these things seem invincible. They have much more powerful engines. They're made out of steel, not wood. And so the general prevailing uh, concept is there's really nothing this big thing can't bowl its way through. They're gonna find out different. Uh, about noon of the 27th, this guy, the Ira H. Owen, is going to pull out of uh, Duluth. It's kind of an interesting looking boat, these twin smokestacks back here. He's carrying 116,000 bushels of barley. That's not even a full load for this guy. It is the last trip of the season for him. And he's going to pull out, like I said, about noon. He's heading downbound. More on him later. But he's the first of a bunch of vessels that are going to be leaving Duluth on the 27th. A couple hours later, about 3.30, Duluth's going to see two vessels leave at the same time. We have the Metapa, which is your typical Great Lakes steamer of the day. And this is the barge, the James Naismith. And they're actually going to leave together for the simple reason that the Metapa is towing the barge. And now that seems a little strange maybe in today's world, but back then, this was normal practice on the lakes. Uh, it was a good profit-raising practice. So uh, in this case, the Metap is only pulling one barge, but it wasn't uncommon for these steamers to pull two, three, sometimes even four barges in one trip. What you're doing, essentially, is you're hauling multiple cargoes on one engine. 
There is a crew on the barge, usually about six or seven sailors. Uh, but there's no engines, so there's no fuel consumption. You have a smaller crew. And so they're going to go up here to two harbors to get a load of iron ore. It's not real bad when these guys pull out of port. It's going to get bad in just a matter of hours. This storm is going to unleash on that western end of Lake Superior. You're going to see waves get up 20, 25 feet. And again, as you get closer to Duluth in that narrower part of the lake, they're going to be coming from three different directions. Uh, winds at Duluth over land are going to be clocked at 60 miles an hour. We have reports from out on the open lake of wind gusts touching 80. The first victim is going to be the Crescent City. He's actually going to get pushed ashore just a little north of Duluth, on the northern shore of Minnesota. And you can kind of see uh, there's a little bit of a bend right here. It, it cracked in half right here on the shore. What just got overpowered by the storm, got pushed up on the rocks. It got pushed so far ashore that all the sailors were safe because all they had to do to abandon ship was lower a ladder over the side and climb down. They didn't have to break up the lifeboats, nothing. It was so far ashore, uh, the life-saving service didn't have to come get them, they just had to climb down a ladder. But you're still a couple miles north of town, uh, late November, in a gale, in snow. Uh, you have to do something. So they send two guys, the second mate and another sailor, they start walking toward Duluth looking for some help. And as they get closer to Duluth, they're starting to pass houses and they're starting to knock on the door asking for help, right? And they can see people looking out the windows and then they don't answer. And the second mate later said, yeah, I kind of get it. We probably didn't paint the best picture, saving us on this deck at 3 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> right? These kind of rather betrayed old sailors. They do end up walking all the way to Duluth. Uh, they let their, their company, the Pittsburgh Steamship Company, know what happened. Their headquarters happened to be in Duluth. So they, they get help up there to go get these guys and bring them back uh, to Duluth. So the Crescent City is going to be the first, the first wreck of the storm. Then comes the RW England. And he's going to try Mission Impossible in conditions like this. He's actually inbound at Duluth. If you can kind of see right here these two little lines, to get into Duluth Harbor, you have to go through the two piers. There's one canal that goes in and out. Now, you have to be spot on to hit those, hit those piers just right so you can get through. He's going to try to do this in, you know, 65 mile an hour waves, 20 foot waves. And there's an extra problem. He has following seats. So for these rudders to work on these ships, you guys all know, you know the rudder the back turns and turns the ship. You have to have water going past that for it to bite and turn that ship. When you have waves coming behind you, there's this split second where the water is traveling faster than the boat and your rudder won't work. So he has very limited steering and he's trying to hit this really narrow gap and it doesn't work. So he's coming in, he's going to get right off of the piers and he's going to misjudge it. The storm's going to take him and he's going to push the RW England south and he's going to land out here on uh, Minnesota Point, which essentially is a giant sandbar. If you're going to go ashore, this is the place to do it. Uh, you're, he's not really on the rocks, he's just up on a giant sandbar. Everyone from the England is able to get off relatively easy. Uh, the England's not going to take a lot of damage. So he's stuck down here, just a little bit south of Duluth. We come up here, we've got to run up the uh, north shore here of Minnesota, just past Silver Bay. And the freighter George Spencer and his barge, the Amboy, are going to go on the rocks. And they have a pretty interesting rescue tale. There is a small fishing settlement up there. And what the, what the sailors do is they manage to tie a line to a board, throw it over the side, and the waves push that board ashore so the, the uh, fishermen can grab it. And they get this line, and they're able to get the guys off the, uh, off the ships. And so these, these fishermen are able to rescue the crews of two ships. Uh, pretty ingenious way to get a lion short. Um, so those two are on the rocks. When I say they're going ashore, this is what I'm talking about. 
They're not going on a nice sandy beach somewhere. These are 100 foot cliffs, and obviously this is on a calm day. So if you can imagine 25 foot waves crashing into these, these cliffs, this is where these guys are going ashore at. And when waves come ashore, that's when they're at their most powerful. So they're really getting pounded by heavy seas up against rocky cliffs. Uh, abandoning ship is a tricky proposition at best. It's almost impossible. You come down a little bit north of Two Harbors, there's an area, uh, there's a cliff down there that's known as Split Rock. And that's going to see the steamer Lafayette and its barge, the Manila, go ashore. And you can kind of see, to illustrate what I was talking about, how hard they got pounded, this is the Lafayette. If you notice, the front half of the boat is gone. It's in pieces under the water. So this is a steel-hulled ship that got pounded literally into small chunks of steel. Uh, the stern section is there. This is the barge, the Manila. And it got kind of like the Crescent City. It was pushed so far ashore that they were able just to climb down the line onto the, on the dry land. The Lafayette is going to have one casualty. And that's going to be the third assistant engineer. So what happened is the, the crew of the Lafayette is going to go they're going to get onto the, onto the barge, and then from there onto the ground. Well, this uh, third assistant engineer, he's running down the deck. It's dark out, it's snowing, and he had a bad habit of running over top of the hatch covers. And the captain had told him several times, not a wise idea. Uh, so he's, he's walking down the deck, uh, trying to get off the Lafayette onto all the shipmates onto the barge, and he doesn't see that one of the wooden hatch covers has been blown off. He actually falls into the open hatch. And he's going to be the only casualty from these two wrecks. Right in the same spot, you're going to have another ship <coughs> barge go ashore. You're going to have four boats go ashore relatively close to each other at the Split Rock region. Uh, the William Edenborn and this barge, the Madeira. Here's the Edenborn. Uh, this is how she landed. You can kind of see the bow is well out of the water here. She's going to get wedged into two rocks. Uh, not going to take a lot of damage. She will be salvaged later. Um, there are fishermen that know about these ones, and these guys can't quite get to these wrecks. So, but they are able to get to Duluth and let Pittsburgh Steamship Company know, uh, you have a couple boats in trouble, and you might need to send help. So Pittsburgh Steamship Company calls up to two harbors, and hires this little tugboat, the Edge of G. And they send her out to go get their sailors off of these two wrecked ships. The Edge of G is actually kind of a historic vessel in her own right. Um, she goes on to become the last coal fired tugboat left in service, working uh, to help ships into the docks of two harbors into the 1980s, power with coal. When she's retired, uh, she now serves as a museum ship up there in Two Harbors, and you can go visit her today. I think in about a week or two here, she's about to celebrate her 125th birthday. So this little piece of the story is still around to go visit. So I talked about these ships coming into Duluth trying to make the safety of the harbor. This is what they're trying to hit. Now if you can imagine 25 foot seas rolling in, and 60 plus mile an hour winds, this doesn't look so bad. Consider the conditions in 1905, it's a whole different story. And you have a lot of vessels, I told you about the ships that were leaving port, well there were a lot of ships already coming across Lake Superior that were trying to get in. And it, it leads to some, uh, some pretty interesting drama, and by now, the people of Duluth it's a maritime community. They know what's going on, and people start showing up down at the piers. And they start showing up on the shoreline. They're watching these ships come in. This hot boat here, this is the Arizona. This is a little wooden steamer uh, that carries lumber. This is stacks of boards on her deck. And she's coming in, and she's going to try to make these piers. And somehow, the waves pick her up. She spins around three times in the waves and somehow manages to go right through the piers and make the safety of the harbor. Probably blind luck there, because once you spin around three times, you are not in control of your vessel. But she manages to, luckily, 
come in sideways, backwards, and everything but upside down, but she does get safely into the harbor. This big guy down here, this is the Isaac L. Elwood. It's a fun name to say three times. This is one of the larger steamers of the day, large steel steamer, and he is going to make it into the harbor, pinballing his whole way down the piers. So he gets into, he gets in between those two piers and the waves pick him up and starts bouncing off the north pier, then over and off the south pier, then back to the north pier, bashing in hull plates as he goes. And uh, he does make it into the harbor and promptly sinks. So technically, the Elwood is a wreck of the 1905 storm, but luckily, he sank in the safe waters of Duluth Harbor, not out in the open lake. And with every ship that comes in, you've got all these people on the shoreline, and they're cheering. They're watching gladiators in the Coliseum. <laughs> they're down there just cheering these ships on. Because these people, they know sailors. They might be related to sailors. They know what these guys are going through, and they want to see these guys make it in so bad. There's another ship they don't know is coming yet. I just told you, remember I told you about the Metallica that was heading up to two harbors? Well, Captain Humble, when he gets up to two harbors, realizes he can't make that. He can't get in the harbor, he can't make the dock up there. In fact, going into the storm and trying to tow this barge, he's barely making any forward headway. He's almost sailing full speed ahead at a standstill. So he decides to turn around and he's going to head back to Duluth. What he's hoping for, he's hoping the storm's going to start dying down before he gets there. It's not going to. So when he gets to Duluth, he's really in a bad spot. He's not going to turn around into the waves. He was able to turn around from two harbors because he was turning with the waves. He knows he doesn't have the power to turn back into these, into these waves. So he has nowhere to go. He has to try to get through the piers, but he's towing a barge. So he blows the appropriate whistle signals, which tells the crew on the barge that James Naismith, you're going to anchor. Drop your anchors. I'm going to drop the tow line. You're on your own. How'd you like to get a guy on that barge? You have no engine, and your tow ship just told you you're on your own. Well, these big power vessels are going down around you. That may seem cold-hearted to us, but in 1905, believe it or not, that's normal. And these guys on the barge, they knew what to do. They did their jobs, they dropped their anchors. It was completely typical protocol of the day uh, to just drop. Believe it or not, the, the barges typically survived more often when they went to anchor than trying to be towed uh, by their steamer. And if you think about it, with these conditions, trying to hit that tiny little canal the power steamer is barely muted. A, a barge on the end of a tow line has no chance. So the Naismith is dropped off. He goes to anchor. Captain Humble lines the Metapha up with the canal, and it's full speed ahead. He has one shot, and he's going for it. He almost makes it. He's right at the end of the piers, and a wave gets up underneath the stern, and it picks the stern up, and it drops the bow down, bounces it right off the bottom of the lake, and then over and right into the North Pier head. This is an actual photograph. Believe it or not, in 1905, someone was standing up there with a camera. <laughs> this is the moment of impact. So he's over here, you can see the starboard bow going into the North Pier head. Uh, that wave also ripped out the rudder, so he can no longer steer the metaphor, and he's punched a huge hole in the bow. The waves are going to grab the ship and spin it around. So you can see this pier, you know, this is where he hit the first time. It spun it around, so the pier is now about midship. And it's going to spin one more time and go do a 180. He's now facing the opposite direction of this picture. So now he's over here facing the opposite way. And this is where the metaph is going to come to a stop. He sinks right there. Obviously, he's only about 100, 125 yards off the shore right here. So it's pretty shallow water. It doesn't take long. You can see the waves have cracked it in half, and the stern has, has sunk down into the water. And Captain Humble can actually talk to the people on shore with his megaphone. That's how close he is to shore and safety. But he's right here, um, and he's going nowhere. So all these guys on the Metaphor are now waiting for help. They're waiting for rescue. 
And who's that rescue going to be? Well, this is the days of the old U.S. life-saving <coughs> service. These are the guys before the Coast Guard. And Duluth has a life-saving service station. And these guys are supposed to come up. They make their living when storms come up. And they go rescue guys off of wrecks just like this. That's what they train for. So everyone in Duluth, all the guys in the Metapha, they're waiting for these lifesavers to show up. And they're not showing up. And people are starting to wonder what's going on. There are guys, there are, I think, 12 men trapped back here on the stern, and they have a particular problem. The Metapha is an unusual vessel. She has no stern deck house above the main deck. All of those guys' cabins are below the main deck. So when, when that ship cracked in half and the stern sank, well, their cabins flooded. So it forced them out onto the main deck. So they're standing out there with waves breaking over top of them in the 60 mile an hour winds, in the snow, in sub-zero wind chills. They can't last very long. And they're going to get desperate. Again, someone there with a camera. This little dot right here, this is a sailor trying to walk to the forward end of the ship. He is grabbing that metal railing and he's trying to walk 400 some feet to the bow. Because these guys up here, they have cabins. There's 15 guys up here. They're actually in the, uh, the captain's cabin. They're staying warm. Ships back then had wood paneling on the walls. They're ripping that off and they're, set, they're making a fire with it in the captain's bathtub. And that's how they're staying warm. And these guys are freezing to death. So these guys, this, is, this is a guy trying to make a 400-some foot walk to safety. That's how desperate he got. Keep in mind, you can't see it in this picture, but there are waves washing right over this deck. 20 footers that are hitting with several tons per square foot on him. Uh, I believe it's three guys make it. Incredibly, three, I think it's three, get all the way forward to safety. This, you can see him here in the inset here. This is Thomas Woodby, and he is going to try to be number four. And he's actually washed overboard, I think, three times. Now, by all accounts, he is one massive guy. You don't work in the engine room without building up some serious muscles. And he's able to hang on to the railing. Even though he's hanging off the side of the ship, he's able to maintain his grip on the railing and pull himself back up three different times. And I think it's the fourth time he's washed over. He was about here, maybe closer to halfway, and it happens again, and he gives up. And everyone on the shore is watching as he turns around and goes back to the stern, and they all just, no, you're halfway there. But he couldn't do it, so he turned around and went back. So now there's nine guys back here on the stern waiting for help. And the people of Duluth are starting to get mad. Where are the lifesavers? They should not. We've never seen them take this long to get to a ship in distress. Where are they? Because these guys are not going to last long. We can't get to them. The professionals aren't here. Where are they? Simple answer is they're down here trying to help the RW England. When they got the call that the England had gone ashore, the Metapha wasn't there yet. The Metapha wasn't supposed to be heading for Duluth. He was going to Two Harbors. For all the lifesavers knew, he was safe tied to a dock in Two Harbors. They had no way to know. So they're down here trying to help the RW England, and someone's got to walk all the way down here, and I think it's close to a mile, and let them know, hey, you've got another ship that needs serious help. You've got to get back to Duluth on the double. So they have to grab all their gear, which includes a beach cart loaded with all their stuff, their wild gun, their beach, uh, their surf boat, everything else. And they have to walk through the sand. This is a sandbar. So they got to walk through the sand all the way back up here to go help the Metaphor. So the lifesavers will finally arrive. Now, their first option is they're going to try to get a line to the Metaphor. They want to use what they call a breaches buoy. So they're going to shoot what they call a wild gun, which is a mini cannon, and they shoot it that has a weight on it with a line attached. And the idea is the sailors can grab that line and they can rig it up between the ship and shore, and then the lifesavers will, will winch out there what they call a breaches buoy, which is essentially a giant life frame with a big pair of canvas pants in it. And one sailor's going to get in those giant pants and they're going to hoist him all the way to shore with him bouncing through the waves all the way up there. And then when they get in ashore, they're going to send that buoy back out, and the next guy's going to get in. So yes, I'm not making this up. 
your ship is wrecked, you're ashore, your rescue shows up, and the first thing they do is shoot a cannon at you. That's going to make you feel real good, right? Uh, it doesn't work for the Metapha. They tried three times. One time it gets followed in the lines. One line actually broke on them. So they can't get the breaches buoy set up. So they're going to do this the old-fashioned way. They're going to row out to the Metapha. And this is, again, this is a photograph. This is not a painting. This is, this is them trying to row out to the Metapha and go get these guys. And that's what they do. When the big steel ships go down, these guys go out in wooden rowboats and they go get them. There's a reason why their motto is regulations say we have to go out. They don't say we have to come back. And very rarely in all my research do they ever not get those guys off the ship. Very rarely do they lose a man when they get there. They try several times. And even these guys say, we can't. It's 100 yards, a little more. They can't get there. Their boat keeps capsizing. Uh, they actually get pushed backwards in the wave. These aren't volunteers that you know commandeered somebody's rowboat, folks. These are professionals. They train in this boat daily for exactly this scenario. And they finally have to say, we can't make it. So the people in Duluth, they start building bonfires on the beach to let these guys on the Metapha know, we haven't forgotten you. We're still trying to get there. Hang in. We're coming. It had to be somewhat comforting for those guys to at least see this huge crowd on the beach and all these fires, if nothing else than to say, just so they know they're not alone. The next morning, on the 29th, the storm started to die down and the lifesavers can get out to the Metapha and this is what she looks like. She's pretty beat up. They row out here to the bow and Captain Humble runs out there with his megaphone and says, we're all fine. A little chilly, but everyone's okay up here. Go check on my men back aft. Go check on them. And when they get back there, what they find is they're all gone. They literally have to chip them out of the ice. There's guys that are frozen. One guy tries to hide down here by the smokestack. He's all encased in ice. One guy, you, you can kind of see this funny looking shape right here. That's a ventilator. I think of it as a it's a big, oversized piece of pipe that's bent 90 degrees, and what it does is it forces fresh air down to the engine room so those guys uh, can get some, some oxygen down there. Those steam engines kind of eat it all up if you don't. One guy actually crawled inside of this. He's all huddled up. He's looking toward shore. He's looking toward those fires that he can see, and he's frozen solid. They're trying to hide anywhere they can to get out of the elements. And there's just nowhere to go. You know, if there had been a, a deck house with cabins for them to get in, they had a chance. But when that stern sank and their cabins flooded, they couldn't survive a night out in those elements. So nine, this doesn't really, this isn't really accurate. It says nine drowned. Six of them froze. A couple guys did drown. But six of them froze right where they were, waiting for help to arrive. Ironically, the Naismith was just fine. When the storm died out, the tugboat went out, picked her up, brought her in safely to harbor. She rode out just fine enough on her anchors. Remember my story of Thomas Woodgate? Well, when they, when they chipped him out of the ice, they found a letter in his pocket from his father. And it's a little hard for you to read, I know, but he, said, he says, There has been much more stormy weather, but as it would take all the U.S. Navy to wreck the old Kensington, I have dared to presume that you are safe and sound. In 1905, sailors would sail on multiple ships every year. You might jump to a different ship at a certain dock because maybe it's a better captain, maybe it's better pay, it's a better company. Unlike today, when you sign on, you're going to be on one ship for the whole season. These guys might sail on five, six, seven different ships in a season. Thomas Woodgate's father thought he was on a ship called the Kensington. And he was looking at, he was reading the news, he was reading the reports, and he wasn't seeing the Kensington's name, so he thought his son was safe. He didn't know his son was on the path of. And they found this letter from him in Thomas' pocket. This picture kind of says it all to me. Uh, this is the Metapha again. Again, this is the next day, so the storm is dying down. You can still see these waves 
crashing over. This is what three guys and Thomas Woodgate tried to walk through to safety. Um, and you can see the, the buildings, and that's how close to shore they were. Not that far. That close to safety. And they couldn't make it. Uh, the first body from Metaphys recovered. One guy apparently got out, all, got out of all his heavy winter clothes and coat, his overalls and big heavy rubber boots, and he tried to swim to shore because he knew he wasn't going to make the night where he was. He felt his best option was to try to swim the hundred or so yards to shore. He didn't make it. Uh, another guy reportedly tried to jump from the stern of the Metapha onto the Duluth Pier. I think it should have been about 30 yards or so, but he tried to get that far and couldn't make it. These guys were desperate at the end. They had to send divers down into the stern to go find the other guys. And as all this is going on, the people of Duluth are getting very angry. And they're starting to say things about the lifesavers. And some of the articles in the Duluth papers are very unkind to Captain McLennan and his crew. And so there's this growing resentment um, amongst the townspeople toward these lifesavers. And then something strange happens. They start getting more bodies. Well, they found the guys on the Metapa. One is a skeleton. Where are these things coming from? A couple of years prior, there was another shipwreck just outside of the Duluth Harbor. So a mile out, the Thomas Wilson was rammed by another ship and it sank. And this storm actually ripped some of the bodies loose from that shipwreck and washed them ashore a couple of years later. Ironically, one of the guys that survived the Crescent City a few miles away, Arthur Daggett survived the Thomas Wilson. And so he was waiting there safe and sound from his latest shipwreck as his former crew and he started coming ashore. Fast forward into December 2nd. The whole region is reeling from what's going on. Every hour it seems there's a new report of another ship ashore somewhere along the Minnesota shoreline. By December 2nd, it's realized no one's heard from the Ira H. Owen. Where's he? That one carrying the barley that I told you about. By December 2nd, the owners have pretty much written her off. And they said, don't know, but she, she has to be gone. We would have heard from her by now had she made safe harbor somewhere. And she's going to take a crew of 19 with her. There will be no survivors from the Owen. And nobody felt worse than the ship's owner. He himself was a licensed Great Lakes captain, and he had just spent the last three days in Duluth personally making sure that this ship was ready for November sailing. He'd gone over it, and if there were hatch, uh, hatch clamps that needed replacing, he replaced them. If there was other equipment that wasn't working properly, he had it fixed. He buttoned this ship up tight. He made sure it was as seaworthy as possible, and he even says, I have no idea. I have no idea what could have happened to that ship that could have lost that crew. I did everything I could to make sure that it was safe. I can't, I, I have no answer. This is Captain Thomas Hunter. Believe it or not, he actually was sailing on the Owen as the first mate. He was already done for the season. He was captain of another ship. And he was already in winter layup. His ship was at, at the dock for the winter. He was home, ready to enjoy. He was actually going to be home for Christmas. And in 1905, that was a strange thing for a sailor on the Great Lakes. And his friend was the owner of the Owen. And the Owen's regular captain got sick to the point where he couldn't actually do his job. Um, the, the captain was still on board. Uh, but he was just too sick to carry out his duties. So the owner of the Owen called, called this guy and said, can you come sail for one trip for me? So he's sailing his first mate. He's actually performing the job of the captain. He's sailing this ship for one trip for his friend to help him out. And he's not going to make it home. Just to make it a little bit worse, he's from Grand Haven, Michigan. His brother is also a ship captain. And the reports got her wrong, and the townspeople went and told the wrong lady that her husband was gone. Oh. 
and it took a couple hours to straighten up the confusion. So he tried to help out a friend for one trip, and it was one trip too many. The last report of the Owen was right here off the Apostle Islands. And it's going to be this ship, the Harold B. Nye, is actually going to see him in, in the height of the storm. <coughs> the Owen is blowing distress signals with a steam whistle. You can, you know, even though he couldn't hear it, you can see the puffs of steam coming from the whistle. And he knew that the Owen was in trouble. But so was his ship. He could not render any assistance. He was taking too much of a pounding himself. In fact, when the Nye makes safe harbor at two harbors, it's found that uh, his ship is sitting 10 feet lower in the water than it's supposed to be. That's how much water he took on in the middle of the storm. So he was in no condition to help. Um, he's watching the Owen through his binoculars, and then a squall comes up and he can't see it anymore, and when the squall clears, the Owen is gone. On December 1st, the day before the newspapers reported, uh, the hope for the Owen was lost, the William Simmons actually sails through Owen's wreckage down here. Sails through pieces of a ship, wood paneling, uh, life jackets that are marked Ira H. Owen, and at that point, they know that she's gone. And to this day, the Ira H. Owen has never been found. She's still down there somewhere waiting. And I assume at some point, there's a group out there that is extensively searching Lake Superior and they're finding all sorts of lost wrecks. I don't think it will be a whole lot longer and someone may find her. But for now, she's still missing. Here's what we're looking at by the time this is done. These are all the wrecks I just told you about. The William E. Corey is the flagship of the Pittsburgh Steamship Company. She's aground out here by where the Owen was lost. I did not include in this presentation. If you go way up here off my map, um, there's another ship, the Monkshaven, that is pushed aground and lost with all hands. So there's a lot of a lot of wreckage floating around Western Lake Superior right now. You pretty much can't go along the North Shore without spotting the aftermath of this storm. This is Harry Colby. He's the president of the Pittsburgh Steamship Company. They took the brunt of this storm. The Pittsburgh Steamship Company fleet, uh, let me go back to the map for a second. So the William Edenborn and the Madeira, uh, the Lafayette Manila, the Crescent City, the Metapha, the Cory are all from one fleet. So he actually hires a special train and comes up from, I think it's Chicago, up to Duluth, it's how you travel express in 1905, you hire a special train. And he gets up there and takes control of the salvage up, uh, efforts himself. And the first thing he does when he gets there is he speaks up for the life-saving crew. And he says, no, this stuff I'm reading in the newspaper, this isn't going to fly. They had no idea the Metapha was coming. They did their duty. They went and answered a distress call from another ship. They did exactly what they should have done. And what I'm reading in the paper is disgraceful. He basically calls out the entire city of Duluth in writing, in the daily paper, and says, you guys are wrong. You need to lay off these guys. Just because the storm's over doesn't mean the excitement is over. Now you have the ships that survived the storm out on the lake showing up. And the condition they're showing up in uh, is quite interesting. So the EC Pope makes the loop. They're actually steering her from back here at the emergency wheel. All of these ships have an emergency steering wheel back at the stern. They're supposed to be steering from up here. Well, everything up here is gone. The waves have ripped the pilot house, the forward cabins, the steering wheel, everything right off the ship. So the captain and mates and wheelsmen had to go back here and they're steering from their emergency wheel. We have the Umbria. <coughs> that mess used to look like this. That's what the waves did to a steel pilot house. This, this is all steel plating that's bent and twisted and ripped. And the, the stories these sailors tell when they get ashore are pretty incredible. And what's even more incredible is they're true. 
the Yosemite. The Yosemite limps in a couple days overdue. People were starting to think she was lost. And when she shows up, uh, her forward cabins look a lot like the Umbria's. And her main deck is sunk down eight inches. The power of the waves bent the steel deck eight inches. And she almost went down, but they managed to save her too. Well, you can't have sailors go through that without having them blow off a little steam when they go ashore. And there seemed, first there was the parade of damaged boats coming into Duluth. Then we had the parade of sailors in front of the local judge. One too few many drinks there in, in the pubs. Walter Crane and many of the others actually have their charges dismissed, and I love this. Uh, he's rescued from the steamer England, he's arrested for drunken disorderly, he's brought before the local judge, and he says, uh, well, I sort of just escaped death on a shipwreck, and uh, people were buying me drinks, and, you know, I was a little stressed out. And the judge says, I am satisfied that many men would have done exactly as you did under the same circumstances. <laughs> the judge actually says, I get it. We probably all would have done that. And even the police officers were siding with these guys and couldn't blame them because he says, everyone's buying them free drinks. What are they going to do? Say no. <laughs> people, I don't know why, but people tend to view shipwreck survivors as, as, you know, these celebrities. Everyone wanted to buy them a drink. They felt bad for them. And next thing you know, they're just uh, a little too inebriated to get back to their ship and they're landing in the county jail. But... Uh, the local judges let them go back to their ships, let them go back to work, and said, don't worry about it, we'll see you next trip. There is an investigation, unfortunately, into the life-saving crew. Uh, the life-saving service headquarters in Washington did send a Lieutenant Winram, and it's pretty much just pro forma. If we're being honest, everyone knew that he wasn't going to find any wrongdoing on the part of these guys, and that's exactly what he found. However, Captain McLennan of that crew never really got over this. First off, those guys took pride in not losing sailors. And he took it incredibly hard that he lost nine so close to shore. He also never really got over the criticism that he and his men took from the city of Duluth. And uh, he lived a few years after this, I believe, maybe, uh, maybe about 10 years or so. And then uh, he passed away. He just, by all accounts, he was just never really the same guy after the Metaphy story. So when this is all over, uh, the western end of Lake Superior sees nearly 20 vessels wrecked. Most of them are going to be salvaged because they're pushed ashore where they can be salvaged, taken to a shipyard, and fixed up. Most of these ships will sail again, including the Metaphy. Uh, Harry Colby, it's unusual to see the, uh, the head of a large corporation like that actually getting on a tugboat and going and inspecting the damage himself, but he is there. He's going out to these wrecks, he's inspecting and seeing what's going on. He says the uh, steamer William Corey, the, um, the flagship of his fleet, not a lot of damage. They should get her off the rocks pretty easily. They get the RW England off. That was probably the easiest job because that was up on a sandbar. The William Edenborn is going to stay at Split Rock for the winter. It will get pulled off, it will get, will get uh, fixed up, but that's going to be a harder job. The shipyard in Duluth is going to be swamped. Nineteen large steel steamers are going to lay up for the winter in Duluth and go to that shipyard for repairs. Now, 19 ships, especially in 1905, 19 ships will go into a single shipyard for the winter is not unusual. 19 Rex ships is another story. Normally they're doing winter maintenance, maybe they are replacing some hatch covers, maybe they're fixing some hatch clamps, maybe they're fixing a railing, a steam pipe. They're not putting ships that are broken half back together. The city of Duluth is going to be working fast and furious all winter to get this many ships back working by spring. This storm is going to cost three and a half million dollars in damage in 1905 dollars. Think about that. 
We would say three and a half million is a lot of money today. This is a 1905 allergy that cost that much to fix up the damage. Then you get the parade of broken ships coming into that ship here. This is actually the stern of the Lafayette they brought down from the North Shore. The bow section is still on the bottom today. It's all ripped up and into uh, small plates. The waves made quick work of it, but they were able to save the stern section. And they did manage to refloat the metaphor and bring her into port and get her fixed up as well. There were some things that came out of this storm. One, a lighthouse. People had been saying for a number of years that there needed to be an aid in navigation at Split Rock. That once ships left Duluth, they really didn't have any way to take a bearing until they got way down the lake. And some of these captains that got in trouble with Split Rock, maybe they could have taken action earlier. Had there been a lighthouse, they would have known. Because in the chaos of, of waves coming from three directions and snow and dark, they had lost track of where they were. Remember, in 1905, a captain has three things to navigate by. His chart, his compass, and his pocket watch. There is no GPS. There is no radar. There is no sonar. There is nothing. He has those three tools to navigate by. Well, if you can't see, if it's dark, if it's a snowstorm, and you can't see, well, you're in trouble. And with, with the storm blowing that hard, you can't really calculate what speed you're making very well. It's going to be off. Had there been a lighthouse, they could have seen the lighthouse. They would have known, they could have taken the bearing from that, they could have made a course correction, they could have done something. So in direct uh, aftermath of, of the storm, they're going to build Split Rock Lighthouse just, a, I think, two years later. And if you look, you see these people up here at the top. And if you were up there and were looking on the other side of that cliff, you would literally see the white marker buoys of the shipwrecks that, from this storm that weren't salvageable. They're that close. So Split Rock Lighthouse was built, and it saved many ships from wrecking over the next several decades. We have two survivors of this storm still with us for now. This is the J.B. Ford. Uh, in 1905, she was the E.C. Collins, and she came limping into Duluth a couple days after the storm. Uh, she's sort of still with us. She's being cut up for scrap right now. They started cutting on her just a couple months ago, um, fittingly in Duluth. So that's where she's ending her days. Uh, so the E.C. Collins during the storm, Later on, she became part of the Wolf Barge fleet here in Alpena. So this boat has sailed in and out of Alpena many, many times. And she's going, uh, <coughs> going away to scrap here up in Duluth. There's one more survivor of this storm. And he hasn't changed very much since 1905, just a few things. But if you go to Ridgetown, Ontario, you'll see the William E. Corey. He's a break wall now. And using the Great Lakes Freighter as a break wall is not unusual. Uh, there's two in Charlevoix, there are two in Cleveland, there's one in Sarnia, Ontario, there's one in Sault Ste. Marie. What is unusual is leaving all the cabins and everything intact. They usually cut all that off. Not so with the Ridgetown. Really, the only difference is they've added this uh, marker here on, on our nose. But they left everything else intact. So if you go to Ridgetown, Ontario, you can see a turn of the 20th century Great Lakes bulk carrier. And she's sunk down to, that, this is what she would have looked like loaded. So she's about her, her loaded water line. And she's going to be around for a long time. So there's going to be a piece of this story physically with us for a very long time. Um, the 1905 storm took everyone by, I shouldn't say surprise. They knew the storm was coming, but the amount of damage and just how just how hard the storm hit really took people off guard. Um, that's kind of why some historians claim this is the worst storm that ever hit the Great Lakes. Others will say it's the big 1913 storm because that wrecked many more ships and hit four lakes instead of one. Some people also claim the 1940 storm on Lake Michigan was the worst because that had the strongest winds. There's an argument for each one depending on which metric you want to use. Uh, but for one small region of Lake Superior, this one's going to be hard to beat. 20 ships wrecked in less than half of a lake. 
that that's that's a lot in one small area. It overwhelmed the rescue capabilities of the life saving service. Uh, local fishermen had to help out. Um, but that is there's a lot more I can talk about this storm, but you don't want to be here till ten o'clock at night. So um, generally speaking, we usually take a Q and A when we're all done and my uh, my host back there is telling me to hang on one second. I'm just waiting for the go ahead. Maybe. Does anyone have the Jeopardy theme? He should be good. Okay. So that's that's uh, my story on 1905. Did it confuse anyone? Is there questions? What is your favorite wreck of that storm? Of that storm? It has to be the Metapha. I mean, that is dramatic as it gets, and it's all real life. Reality TV's got nothing on that story. Anything else? Chuck? All these ships are single screw, right? Yes. Why in the world did they build two screws and breakers? Well, they did later, but in 1905, that wasn't necessarily an option. It took a while for someone to figure out how to do that. Um, in 1905, yeah, so the, the two screws, um, a lot of ships today will have two propellers, not just one. Um, what that does is not just extra power, but it makes them more maneuverable. You can use the twin propellers for steering. Um, and in 1905, really the only thing that was using twin screws was the car ferries. And that's because they were so much wider. The, the ore carriers were a pretty narrow boat, and it was going to be pretty hard to put, put twin propellers on. They had to get a wider beam first. Anything else? So if a barge can just anchor out there and be fine, what was stopping the ship from doing the same thing? Right. I mean, they have an engine. Yeah, uh, yeah it, that's a great question, and I've wondered that myself. But um, you know, they could have they could have dropped a hook, and even they didn't have an engine, so they could have run the engine and slow ahead to take the pressure off the chains, um, and they probably would have been just fine. But ship captains are a unique breed, and they are not going to admit defeat that far from safety. Other ships have made it through, and he was going to as well. The ships nowadays, um, if they come across a storm like this, one, are they better prepared? Like, they just get out of trouble, or can they handle that trouble better? Or do they just, um, just run for shore space? What's, what's nowadays protocol? Protocol now is find cover if you can. Um, there's always the oddball case. The weatherman is still wrong in 2021. If you're caught out in it, you got to go somewhere. Uh, if you're in the middle of the lake, you can't just anchor. You don't have enough chain. Um, but now, with the bigger ships, with the bigger ships, they can handle more, too, than these things can. They're, they're longer, they're wider, it's better quality steel. Um, so they can handle more. And also, you don't have the rush to get the cargo there on time, because they are bigger. They, they're hauling more per trip. Back in these days, uh, the ships pretty much had to arrive on time to keep the industrial plants operating. The ship showed up late, they may have to shut down the plant for half a day or a day because they were eating up the, the, up the ore as fast as the ships could carry them. So there was really a push to not be late on the captains. And in, back in this day, there's even uh, rumors, probably true, that companies would give bonuses to the captains that delivered the most. And that's all, that's all gone. Now, uh, with these ships being you know, three-figure millions investments, yeah, they're, the owners are just saying, just keep it, keep it intact, keep it floating. <laughs> get there when you get there. So they, they pretty much take cover if they need to. And they are better prepared because weather forecasting is better. You know, um, in 1905, they could get warnings if they were in port or going through the Sioux locks. Now these guys can get weather reports out in the middle of the lake. And if something's cropping up and it's going to hit unexpectedly, they can make a turn and head for the shoreline. So they can get... They can get that warning even after they left. So, yeah. Jeff, did you say uh, 
you know, so there's several lakes. You get a lot of experience in Ohio, all the lakes. Are there places to go for these ships, uh, you know, within reason, with technology that we have for forecasting? So where they can do that, they, there's, you know, there's some place they can go even if it's... Oh, yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, there are places where there's just nowhere to go. Um, but, yeah, there's there are places they know where to go. Uh, and it all, that all depends on what direction the wind's coming from, where the waves are headed. Um, but there are harbors um, all up and down the lakes. Really, about the only... If you're, if you're right in the middle of the lake, you're going to have some travel time. The middle of Lake Superior is about the worst place to get caught, unless you can get underneath the Keweenaw Peninsula. Um, but by and large, it, it doesn't take too long, especially again with the advanced weather forecasting. They, they get a heads up with enough time for them to get somewhere where they can anchor. Can I add to that, if you get the um, marine traffic app on your phone, and, and you see the storms coming in, you can go and watch, and they'll park like parking lots. They'll just be um, along the east side of, of Whitefish. You'll see them just in there, just like a parking lot. And you can put it on a, you can put it on a view where you're seeing the actual satellite. It's amazing. That's what you can tell where the boat nerd is in the crowd, right? <laughs> Plug in for marine traffic. <laughs> Yes. Yes, there was damage to boats in the harbor. Uh, one boat actually got sued because they they damaged the dock they were at in the winds. Um, and apparently there was an argument over they had tied up where the dock told them not to. And and uh, so yeah, there was damage inside the harbor as well. Yep. It's a big harbor, so even though it's even though it's protected behind that sandbar, there's still lots of room for wind to cause some problems. Definitely. Were there any casualties to the people who were standing on the docks um, with the canal? Not that I'm aware of. No. Um, other than maybe a few minor cases of frostbite, I mean, they were standing out there in the cold for a long time. But, but no, there was no, as far as I know, there were no casualties to the, to the people watching. As far as I know, I didn't find any stories of anyone swearing off of sailing after that. Um, you know, especially in 1905, shipwreck was part of the job. Um, it was not. Now, this many in one spot was unusual, but you know, in 1905, shipwrecks happened weekly. It was just an accepted risk. It, it was not the huge story that it is now when a ship goes down. So as far as I know, they all just found another job and uh, went back at it. Any other questions? How many casualties were there? Approximately 36 were lost total. And I say approximately because back then, the regulations on keeping crew lists was pretty lax. So we don't know precisely how many were on some of the boats, but right around 36, which is really incredible when you think about how many ships were wrecked. I mean, you have 20, 20 ships that are wrecked and you lose less than 50 is really, uh, is really, and 19 of them came on one wreck with the IRHO and them going down with all hands. So if you take the Owen out of that, uh, really the rescue attempts are downright incredible. Any other? Well, that being said, thank you very much for coming out, and thank you, Matt, for hosting another one. And if I'm not mistaken, it's July 24th. We're going to be back here doing it again, and that one's going to be on the uh, steamer, the passenger steamer, the Eastland, which is going to be the deadliest shipwreck on the Great Lakes ever. Still is. And it all happened three feet from the dock. And if you want to know how that affected things like Monday Night Football, and a World War I German U-boat, they want to be here.